All right, welcome everyone to this month's Home Dialysis Journal Club for the Central Time Zone of the ISPD's North American Chapter. Today we have Dr. Rasmita Jala presenting. Dr. Jala did her medical school and residency training at Medical College of Georgia and is now in her first year of nephrology fellowship here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Hey, hello everyone. Um, thank you for being here. We're going to be talking about um, this this article over here, um, Urgent Start Peritoneal Dialysis in Chronic Kidney Disease Patients, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis Compared with Planned Peritoneal Dialysis and with Urgent Start Hemodialysis. Um, so um, going a little more into the background as to what's kind of led up to um, the production of the study. Um, so essentially, um, even though nephrologists are kind of recommending planned initiation of renal replacement therapy, despite this uh, push in the practice, only about one third of patients who are needing renal replacement therapy, these are all done unplanned. And most of them are typically done via a temporal central line. And there have been studies done in the past that show that doing renal replacement therapy using a temporary line can cause an increased risk of infection, such as bacteremia, and it can also cause an increased risk of death. There was this large retrospective cohort study, which included 40,000 patients. And that study mortality was compared between the PD patients and HD patients, either with um, AV fistulas or grafts or the central line. And in that study, a one-year mortality, um, the one-year mortality was 80% higher uh, in the HD patients with the central lines compared to the patients with the peritoneal dialysis. Um, there have also been some early studies showing that urgent start peritoneal dialysis might be an acceptable alternative to that hemodialysis, but the data and the clinical outcomes and complications regarding urgent start peritoneal dialysis haven't really been clarified in um, earlier studies. So this study is trying to just show if there's any data out there that can show that maybe urgent start peritoneal dialysis might be beneficial compared to um, urgent start HD, especially with the central line. So some of the methods that were involved in how the, the study chose the different articles that were reviewed, um, they did a literature search through databases such as PubMed, Embase, Puckering Central Register of Control, of Control Trials, and they also looked at some conference abstracts through ASN or the European Renal Association. Um, not only did they look at these articles, but they also looked at the reference lists within these articles to see if they can find any other articles through there. The latest date of search uh, was from December 2018, and there weren't any language restrictions. The inclusion criteria with the, for this paper included, um, they looked at randomized controlled trials and also observational studies without randomization. There were also studies that compared, uh, they also wanted studies that compared outcomes of urgent start PD with those of planned peritoneal dialysis or urgent start HD via the central line. They also wanted studies that showed a minimal follow-up period of four weeks, and um, they wanted to look only at studies that had urgent start PD that was, um, that started peritoneal dialysis within or after two weeks of the PD catheter placement. Um, they specifically wanted this because um, according to the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis Guidelines, the traditional healing period after insertion of a PD catheter was about two weeks. 
So some of the exclusion criteria that, um, that they did not include in this paper, so any case reports, review articles, protocols, research letters, um, studies without sufficient data, and the author couldn't be reached to clarify, uh, any duplicate studies that were found in different um, publications, and also um, didn't include any studies that included patients with AKI, mental disorders, pregnancy, or patients um, undergoing lactation. They also wanted, um, they also did not want any studies that had the plan P group, which had initiation less than two weeks after the PD catheter was inserted. The main primary outcomes in this study were um, three different outcomes, all, all cause mortality, cardiovascular events, which included fatal, non-fatal myocardial infarction, unstable angina, stent thrombosis, stroke and heart failure, and all cause uh, rehospitalization, uh, which is the uh, hospitalization after the initiation of dialysis. There are also some other secondary outcomes that the paper looked at. So when it came to secondary outcomes, they looked at the two different groups. There was the urgent start peritoneal dialysis versus the planned peritoneal dialysis group, and then there was the other urgent start peritoneal dialysis versus urgent start hemodialysis. And there were different secondary outcomes for these two different groups. Um, for the first group, where they just um, compared the two different types of peritoneal dialysis. They looked at the technique survival of peritoneal dialysis. So how long were the patients able to stay on PD um, before they might have had to switch over to another mode, such as hemodialysis. Um, they also looked at peritoneal catheter-related complications, average days spent in the hospital, and they wanted to look at these other outcomes, such as the levels of K2 over V, creatinine clearance rates, hemoglobin levels, albumin levels, um, and also the cost of dialysis treatment and patients' quality of life. For the other group, where we looked at the urgent start peritoneal dialysis versus urgent start hemodialysis, they were mostly looking at, um, or different secondary outcomes that they wanted to look at, were dialysis related complications, also average days of um, days spent in the hospital, and also the cost of dialysis treatment and the patient's quality of life. So when they were looking at how they were you know, sifting through all these different articles that came up in their search, they found a total of 456 articles, um, 447 were from databases and nine were from sources. They took all those articles and they removed 146 of them um, because there, there were some duplicates involved. So that brought down the number to 310 articles. And from the 310 articles, they excluded 277 of them because of just looking at the titles. Um, the titles didn't really show that the, they were reaching inclusion criteria. Um, and they're also looking at the abstracts as well to decipher this. So from those um, 220, from the uh, removed articles, only 33 were actually left. And of those 33 articles, they actually read all of these articles. And then from the 33 articles that they completely read, they narrowed it down to 15 um, articles, which were, which were used in the meta-analysis. And these were studies that did meet the inclusion criteria. So only 15 articles in the end were included in this meta-analysis. So um, looking at the study characteristics, out of the 15 articles that were analyzed, only one of them were, uh, was a randomized controlled trial. Uh, 11 of the studies looked at urgent start peritoneal dialysis versus planned peritoneal dialysis. And then um, there were only three studies that looked at only urgent start peritoneal dialysis versus the urgent start hemodialysis. And then there was one study that looked at both um, urgent start PD versus um, both the plan PD and urgent HD. The randomized controlled trial was kind of was put under the urgent start PD versus plan PD group as well. So there were more articles in general looking at the urgent start PD versus plan PD compared to the urgent start PD versus urgent start HD. 
So uh, here are just some of the characteristics of the studies included for the urgent start PD versus planned PD. As you can see, there are a total of 12 articles, one of them being a randomized controlled trial. The other 11 are um, more observation studies, either cohorts or case control trials. Um, and in general, the average age seems to be within the 50s. Um, and I also like to look at, given that these studies are all kind of in different countries, not just in one country, um, I like to look at the characteristics of the patients involved because the patient population in the U.S. is um, typically different from the patient populations you might see in different countries. So um, looking at the diabetic disease, uh, the one study from the U.S., you can see that patients who had diabetic disease were like 50% or 56% from the two different either on urgent planned or planned PD groups. But the other countries are showing in general maybe less percentage of, of diabetic disease. Um, they also see the differences in cardiovascular disease percentages, but not all the articles were able to report that. Um, also looking at the baseline CM, serum creatinine in these studies, um, the unit is different from what we look at here. It's like um, micromoles per liter. Uh, we usually look at um, milligrams per deciliter. So this number, for example, right here is uh, 1,068. That kind of correlates to actually what 12 in what we're used to seeing. So these are relatively high creatinine levels that we're seeing. Um, and then some of the baseline crea or baseline GFRs are measured, and then some other um, numbers that they're looking at, hemoglobin, albumin, not all the studies were able to show that. And you can also see that the peritoneal dialysis, there were different modes um, used as well. And in follow-up periods, they wanted at least um, four week follow-up periods, and most of these were able to meet or, or met that. And then looking at the other uh, data groups between the Urgent Start PD versus the Urgent Start HD, you can see there's significantly less um, articles in this group. Only four articles were here, and they were all um, cohort studies for the most part. Um, the age here compared to the other group, they're a little older, 60s, 70s, some of the 50s. Um, and they also looked at the other without, um, other. Uh, data points such as diabetic disease, cardiovascular disease, and just other lab groups so like creatinine, GFR, hemoglobin, and albumin. So um, this is just kind of looking at how they assess the quality of the studies that they were looking at. Uh, so they were case control studies and cohort studies. There were only two of the case control studies compared to the um, I believe it was 12 of the cohort studies. Um, they looked at the criteria or from the Newcastle Ottawa scale, which, you, which was used to assess the quality of the observational studies. And this kind of looked at the risk of the bias that was assessed on three different aspects that they showed here, um, selection, comparability, and exposure um, in the case control studies and outcome in the cohort studies. Um, just looking at their little scale, they had an average of 6.5 points in the case control studies and 6.1 points in the cohort studies. So in general, these were, um, you can consider them as fair level of data in these studies. So um, looking at the different primary outcomes, uh, we can first talk about the urgent start PD versus planned PD group and the three different pr major primary outcomes here. Um, so the first thing we can look at is the all-cause mortality in the urgent start PD versus planned PD group. Um, so here you can see that out of the 12 total studies that were looked at in the uh, different PD groups, only five of them talked about the all-time mortality rate. Um, but the difference between these two different these two groups is this was unadjusted and this was adjusted. So only these two studies had an adjusted hazard ratio, which took into account that the need itself for urgent start PD could contribute to um, an increased mortality rate. 
So looking at the unadjusted data, um, it actually showed that there was there um, there was a significant difference in all time mortality in the urgent start group compared to the planned group. But if you look at the adjusted analysis where they took into account the adjusted hazard ratio, here there, there wasn't any significant difference between the urgent start PD and the planned PD in all cars mortality. So there was um, two different analyses that they did here. Um, and looking at the other uh, primary outcomes in this group, the cardiovascular events, which is one of the outcomes that they wanted to look at, none of the studies unfortunately mentioned the um, cardiovascular events involved. Um, and then the other one with the all-cause um, rehospitalization, um, there wasn't any significant difference that they found between the urgent start PD and the planned PD. So now looking at the next group between urgent start PD and urgent start HD, um, in this group, they overall didn't see a significant association of all cause mortality given either group. So there wasn't like a increased all cause mortality that they found with the urgent start PD compared to the urgent start HD. So looking at this data over here, um, all uh, four studies that were looked at in this group between the PD and the HD, um, there wasn't any significant uh, association between um, either the urgent start PD or the urgent start HD with the all-cause mortality. However, there was a lot of heterogeneity in this data set. Um, so because of the increased heterogeneity, they did another um, sensitivity analysis where they took out one of the studies. They took out the study done by Lee um, because this one had a increased follow-up um, or a prolonged follow-up group. This one had a follow-up of up to two years while the other three had a follow-up of less than two years. So after they took out that group, um, there was a significant decrease in the heterogeneity and it showed the same thing where there wasn't any association between increased all-cause mortality and the urgent um, PD or urgent start PD group. Um, so looking at the next thing, unfortunately again, uh, none of these articles address the cardiovascular events that they want to look at as one of their main primary outcomes. And um, again, there wasn't any um, significant difference in the all-cause rehospitalization. Um, so, looking at the, again, this is the data here for the uh, rehospitalization rates in the urgent start PD group and the urgent start HD group. And um, only two of the studies out of the four addressed this. And this was rehospitalization within six months. And again, there wasn't really any significant difference. So now going over to the secondary outcomes of urgent start PD versus planned PD, um, looking at the PD technique survival, there wasn't any significant difference between the two different groups here. Um, here you can see um, up here, are the case control studies and over here are the cohort studies and both of them um, show no significant difference in the two different ones for um, uh, PD technique survival. So looking at the next is looking at the PD catheter relation um, related complications. So there are quite a few that they looked at here. The first one was PD catheter leakage. And overall, they were kind of showing, they kind of saw that there was a higher rate of leakage in the urgent start PD patients. So um, over here in the case control studies, there was a significant difference in urgent start PD patients having more leakage compared to the planned PD. However, in the cohort studies, there wasn't a um, significant finding, but there still was that trend that or tendency that there might have been more leakage in the urgent start PD patients compared to planned PD patients. Um, the next one was looking at catheter mechanical uh, dysfunction. So um, here they also found a trend of higher 
of, of higher rates of catheter mechanical dysfunction and urgent start PD patients compared to planned PD patients. Um, again, over here with the case control um, studies, there was, wasn't a significant difference but there was a tendency for more mechanical complications. But in the cohort studies, there was a significant difference um, with the urgent start PD patients having more mechanical complications compared to planned PD patients. Um, the next one was like kind of looking at the surgical interventions required. Um, there wasn't too much data in the actual surgical, if surgical intervention was required for these mechanical, mechanical dysfunctions, but in general, there didn't seem to be a significant difference in surgical interventions required. Um, the next one was looking at peritonitis between the two groups, and overall, there didn't seem to be a significant difference. Um, over here in the case control studies, there was not a significant difference um, between, for peritonitis between the two different groups. And also um, over here with the cohort studies, again, there weren't any significant um, differences with peritonitis between the two urgent star or plan PD groups. And then uh, again, uh, one other uh, complication I was looked at was the exit site infection, which also showed no difference between the two groups. Um, and you can see here with the case control studies, there wasn't any significant difference. And um, with the um, cohort studies, there was a significance here, but it was also showing like a lower rate of uh, exocyte infection with the urgent start PD. But uh, again, in general, there doesn't seem to be a overall higher rate of keratin of exocyte infection with the urgent start PD groups. Um, and then the next thing that was kind of looked at with the secondary outcomes were the um, average days spent in the hospital. And what they, there was only one observational study that talked about this that they looked at. And um, they saw that the urgent start PD group had an, a higher uh, average day spent in the hospital compared to the planned PD group. The mean length of stay for the urgent group was about 11.8 days, while the planned PD group was 7.5 days. And then the next thing, next secondary outcome that they were looking at were the levels of the KT over V, the creatinine clearance, hemoglobin, and serum albumin. Um, among all the studies that they looked at for the for this group of the urgent start PD versus planned PD, there was only one observational study that reported some short-term laboratory measurements. And this study didn't really talk about crowning clearance. It only looked at the KT over V, hemoglobin, and serum albumin levels, and they didn't see any significant difference between the two groups. And um, unfortunately, the studies that they looked at um, did not really address cost analysis or the quality of life um, in these patients. So now looking at the next group of urgent start PD versus urgent start HD. Um, so some of the secondary outcomes that they were looking at are um, infectious complications and two different infectious complications they looked at were bacteremia and uh, peritonitis. They did notice that there was an increase in bacteremia in HD patients uh, compared to the PD patients. Um, so looking at this uh, study over here, uh, this group showed the that there was a significant difference in the bacteremia that was in the urgent start HD compared to the urgent start PD. Um, and then for the uh, peritonitis, when it came to the infectious complications, um, there wasn't really enough data for statistical power to show any um, significant difference in peritonitis between the two groups. Um, there, there, I think in one of the studies that the PD patients did develop some peritonitis, but it didn't really have any statistical power. Um, and now looking at the non-infectious complications, among the PD patients, they looked at, um, there was so there's only one observational study that discussed the non-infectious complications. And in that study among the PD patients, the um, only 3.1% of them had catheter malposition. 
And among the HD patients, there were 3.7% uh, of patients had some complications with bleeding. 7.3% uh, of those patients um, had some complications with thrombosis. And then 2.4% of the HD patients um, had to have um, catheter removal. And another second year outcome, which they talked about were average days spent in the hospital. Um, there's only one study that talked about this and there was any significant difference between the two groups. And then again, unfortunately, between the studies that they looked at, um, the cost of dialysis and quality of life, um, the studies didn't really talk about this outcome. So um, some of the discussion points that they talked about in this article, um, you might have noticed that in the uh, urgent start PD versus plan PD group, there were a lot of, uh, of, a lot of information with the PD related complications. Um, one of the complications that they talked about was leakage and how they did see an increased amount of leakage in the urgent start PD versus the plan PD. And they were thinking that this might be related to the restricted time of wound healing um, in the urgent start PD patients compared to plan PD patients. Um, and they were talking or discussing how maybe this could be prevented by using a small amount of initial fill volume. Um, another complication that was seen to be higher in the urgent start PD population compared to the planned PD population is catheter displacement. And they were saying that because of the patients in um, the urgent PD group and the increased needs and demands that that patient group might have had, it, the catheter displacement might have been more noticeable um, compared to the other group. Um, and usually, because there wasn't any um, surgical uh, differences between the two groups, they were thinking that maybe the displacement was corrected by itself because the surgery wasn't really needed. Um, and another reason as for why the PD technique survival and also because um, the PD technique survival was any different between the two groups that also kind of shows that maybe this catheter displacement wasn't as clinically um, relevant. Um, another thing that they were talking about were, uh, was using urgent for using urgent start specifically automated PD. Um, this might have a uh, reduced risk of mechanical complications overall. It might avoid leakage by reducing the dwell vol volumes and it can also um, cause a or have better adequate dialysis um, because of the increased exchanges that it has. Um, another topic that was you know, talked about in a discussion part was the all-cause mortality. Um, so in um, the patients referred to the urgent start PD group in general were probably sicker than the planned PD group. And this explains why the adjusted analysis showed that there wasn't an all-cause mortality difference because it took into consideration that the patients who needed urgent start PD were probably just at higher risk in general. Um, and then because of the higher rates of complications that they in the study kind of saw during in the PD patients, they were wondering if maybe if it was unclear if those higher rates of complications led to this difference in the all-cause mortality. And then looking at the urgent start PD group versus the urgent start HD group, um, in general, there weren't any significant differences between mortality and rehospitalization in, in this specific in this group. Um, and then you might even consider that maybe urgent start PD might be comparable to urgent start HD and might even have fewer complications. Um, so some of the limitations that this study had, um, the publication bias was unable to be evaluated and um, the uh, in that um, group where we had to look at the uh, uh, unadjusted meta-analysis meta and the adjusted meta-analysis, um, the data in the adjusted group was kind of insufficient. Um, you took five studies and then the adjusted data only had two um, 
articles I was looking at. And because of probably insufficient data, there might be some confounding um, present in these studies. Um, and also a lot of these studies or most of these studies were observational studies. There's only one randomized controlled trial, um, but the rest were observational studies and this could lead to some recall or selection bias. Um, the evidence in general was pretty low quality. Um, and then the, uh, you know, looking at the urgent start PD group versus the planned PD group, a lot of this was focused on the catheter related complications. And um, there were only a few studies that compared the urgent start PD versus the urgent start HD. So um, in general, the article is kind of suggesting more data needs to, more, more studies need to be um, done to kind of have stronger evidence to decide if urgent start PD is in fact um, for sure better than um, urgent start uh, HD um, or even compared with plan PD. So in conclusion, um, the study in general had limited evidence, but it did suggest that urgent start PD may have some outcomes that are comparable to those of urgent start HD, and there might even be a lower risk of bacteremia um, in the urgent start PD group. Um, there's, it's unclear if there's a mortality difference between the urgent start PD group and the planned PD group due to the inconsistent results of the um, adjusted analysis versus the unadjusted analysis. Um, urgent start PD had higher rates of leakage and also had some higher rates of mechanical dysfunction, but it did have comparable rates of PD technique survival and infectious complications compared to the um, planned group of PD patients. Um, in general, uh, Additional high quality and large scale studies are needed to assess whether urgent start PD is comparable to planned PD. Um, and yeah, that's essentially it. Any questions or? As we did, did they talk about how these different studies, how they actually did urgent start PD? There can be a lot of variability too, and how different institutions actually perform and do the urgent start PD. So I'm just curious if they talked about that a little bit. Can you also repeat the question? Oh, yes. So the question was um, if the studies talked about what exactly was um, urgent start PD because different institutions might have different protocols for what urgent start PD entails. And that was kind of brought up in the article how that um, the different studies that they looked at, they did have different definitions of what urgent um, start PD entailed. Um, in general, they, um, they wanted to look at studies that had the that started PD two weeks after that PD catheter was placed, but that was the main, um, I guess, the main standard thing that they looked at, but they weren't able to standardize what it, like the version start key for all the different um, studies and different locations. So that was one of the limitations, I guess you could say, for the article. Um, just curious about, do you have time to look at the study, the one in 2012, that LIU person is look like, uh, even look at forest, plot correctly is to play all the bad outcome is from that study because it's okay shift to the right and a lot of population I'm not sure that is that yeah so I didn't um if we go back to forest plot the first one in the all cause mortality are you talking about how the before or yeah the first one the first forest plot uh, I think going more even more in the primary outcome. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think the first the first one is to like it make the result look it like it ship everything and make it so and it's a lot of population and also like risk ratio like five and it like make everything looks make the urgent PD looks have outcome words. But and I, I'm not sure like how the method in that study like and in 2012, I'm not sure what take 
all the right. tea at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look specifically into that study, um, but um, I kind of mainly looked at the overall outcome for all the studies combined. Um, but even though it was a little more skewed in in general, there it yeah, I, I didn't specifically look into that study. Uh, yeah, I just feel like if we if that study not here, everything might be negative, but it might be good study, a lot of population. I yeah I tried to study, but I did not find for a lot of our patients with logistics for urgent start PD, was making sure they have all the equipment at home, they have trained and whatnot. Could they go into mm -hmm. any sort of details how that they influence patients outcome or like hospital stay from that perspective? Um so oh yes. Um sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. I mean logistics wise, I mean looked into mm -hmm. the difference between urgent start and issue versus PD when it comes to initiation and visiting either hospital stay or decision making in one way or another. So the question was, were there any um, logistics between urgent start HD and urgent start PD and how they, um, I guess, are you talking about how you trained patients or well, leading well, up to the? Yeah, whether it has influenced the outcomes or decision in terms of which way to pursue, because a lot of times in our patients as well, when we initiate somebody, uh, it can be a serious problem when somebody has not trained. They don't have all their equipment and cannot be kept in the hospital forever until that's done. Okay, so essentially looking at the logistics um, leading up to the initiation of, of the HD patients versus the PD patients. Um, I know one of the, I think the randomized control trial actually, it talked about specifically how the, um, how the training was done for the PD patients. I'm not sure about how the other articles, how they address that or if that was addressed or not, but I know in the randomized control trial, they did um, standardize how the patients were trained and made sure that they had the equipment needed and that, that sort of setup was done beforehand. I think if you have someone in the hospital here who needs dialysis initiation, it looks very different if you're thinking about hemodialysis versus, versus urgent start PD. So if you're doing hemodialysis and you ask interventional radiology for a tunneled catheter placement, that's usually going to happen within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then that patient can be started. And by the time they have done their initiation, they may already have a chair. It may take a, a day or two longer, but it's usually not a prolonged delay to get out of the hospital. Versus if you're thinking about urgent start peritoneal dialysis, you contact the surgeon, they may get them on the schedule that week, they may not. Um, if they are able to expedite it for you, and then you, you know, generally we wait 24 hours, start the really low um, flow. So if we can get them on 6MC, we can get them on the cycler, they could potentially do, you know, when they're not standing up, do dialysis 24 hours of the day. Um, you can have them on the cycler like 12 hours in the day, 12 hours at night. So you can really get, try to increase the clearance with these low fill volumes. Um, but if they're somewhere else and they're trying to do manuals, that may not be feasible. So um, once you know that you're doing that, you can contact the unit to see when their training date might be. Uh, that is also gonna be its own thing because they have their own schedule. They, again, you can ask them to expedite, but um, if they are really busy and they can't get them in for a while, it may prolong the hospital stay. You could try to just really get them dialyzed enough. A lot of these people still have residual kidney function, so they may be able to go, once they're dialyzed enough, they may be able to go several days without any dialysis, which is fine. Um, but it takes a little bit more thought, I'd say, to get them safely out of the hospital um, after initiation. And then once they start training, they're going to have enough time to get their supplies at home. So you don't have to worry about it from like that side of things. If you're outpatient, so I've had a situation in clinic where I had a patient come to me for her very first clinic visit with me and she was uremic. She wasn't enough valid enough where I needed to get her into the hospital, but she was like, okay, probably going to need to start in the next few weeks. So we talked about the dialysis modality. She decided to do peritoneal dialysis. 
asked the catheter uh, placement, which got done, I think maybe three or four days later, we started urgent start the next week and it was smooth as can be. So if you reach out and let people know that things need to be expedited, it's very doable. Um, but if there's something emergent, like, you know, they're too volume overloaded to get the PD catheter placed because um, they can't lie down or something like that, then you may end up, you know, not having that as an option. Any other questions? Does anyone online have any experience with do they would like to share? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Hi, this is uh, Osama. Just um, kind of want to emphasize, I think, you know, everything that Dr. Solani said is spot on. Um, and this kind of points towards like how circumstantially it's very hard to really have like a completely randomized control study where, you know, there's no clinical judgment or anything, right, being factored in. It's like purely urgent start PD versus urgent start to HD. It's very hard to replicate that because of the push for like patient preferences and the ethical implications of that kind of imposing, you know, on a patient a modality that may not be of uh, of interest to them. So I think it's, it's good that this uh, paper shows overall not much of a difference. Of course, there are going to be more leaks in the PD patients because AG patients don't have really potential for leaks there but overall we we at least have some idea that by starting a patient urgent start on one modality over another we're not causing them active harm right to our patients that's kind of the take home that i'm you know getting from studies like this but i think it's going to be very hard this is not like trying a drug where we have you know placebo and like you know the intervention drug and we can easily compare the two you know, a, a dialysis is very hard to blind the patient once they get a catheter in their belly versus a catheter in their neck. Um, and, you know, the complications of each modality are, are different. So it is kind of apples to oranges, but we also want to make sure that, you know, that, that they're close enough in terms of the outcomes. And I think that's what that study achieves. If, if I may, um, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if there'll ever be a study that, uh, where not only can you not blind them, obviously that's kind of a joke, but it just even to randomize them PD versus HD, I don't know if that'll ever happen. And so you're left with this stuff. And it's, you know, I think you're right. You're just looking for signals that something is a big problem and there's no, doesn't appear to be. If you can go to your last slide. Yeah, so to me, it's really about urgent start PD versus urgent start hemo, because that's really what you're dealing with. I, you know, comparing urgent start PD to plan PD is kind of, that's, that's probably even more apples and oranges than, than the former, because you're dealing with a patient that needs to be dialyzed. And as was brought up, there's a lot of um, um, obstacles to getting that catheter in, getting fluid, getting trained fast enough. But I think it can be done. You have to, I mean, most of these patients have been out there uremic for a while. A few more uh, days or a week or something isn't going to make any real difference. Unless, as was mentioned, you know, the, it's usually be a volume overload problem that would force you to do something that would that would have you maybe bail on uh, urgent start PD. Urgent start PD, it just takes a real, you got to believe in it. I mean, you just have to believe it and go with it. It took us a while to get there. We're getting better. Um, but if you start doubting yourself because of this and that and the other thing, you'll never do it. But it works out pretty well. Our experience has been pretty good. Fortunately, our surgeons have been getting our catheters in pretty quickly, too. Um, and again, leaking is a, can be a problem, but you know, kind of like my same statement, they've been under, they've been no dialyzed for, for the last, uh, you know, three months of uh, developing their problem. I don't think they need to have big, they don't need to be, you know, think incremental, not only, you know, especially in volume as well as exchanges and everything. And a little dialysis can go a long way, I think, in these patients, and you don't have to worry about the leaking. But it's nice to see, I think this is really nice because it's, what it tells me is, um, really conclusion number one, there's no huge red flag that there's a problem. And so if you believe in it and you think there's the patient's a good candidate, there's only one way to do it and that's just do it and uh, um, and go forward. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? I think there was something in there, but did they comment on 
difference between like IR placing it versus surgery versus an interventional nephrologist placing it in the catheters? Um, the question was if there's anything that was um, talked about like IR versus Oscar surgery placing the um, lines. Um, the, the tables talked about how the, the PD catheter placement technique was a little different in the different studies, but I didn't really talk about vascular surgery versus IR, that type of placement from what I saw. Do you guys have a preference? Vanderbilt? Our, our PD catheters are placed by transplant surgery only. Um, and our lines are only put in by interventional radiology. What about you? Well, we were doing IR quite a bit for PD catheters because they could get it in so quickly. And we just had, quite frankly, we've just had too many too many problems. So we've pretty much doing, doing what you're doing now, exactly the same thing. And, um, you know, I think that uh, IR probably would have less leaking because they can, um, you know, there's less uh, incision or whatever, but, um, but um, they just fail too much, and I don't think their vi the visual, you know, the visualization and a surgeon that really knows what they're doing is is hugely different. So we're only I won't say exclusively, but we, you know, we're pretty much have, have switched completely over. We were all excited about IR because they were so fast, but uh, I think it was uh, a free lunch, and and so we're using surgeons <laughs> as well now. That's good to know. We all know there's no such thing as a free lunch, so. <laughs> they all got their free lunch with conference today. <laughs> well, Roger, no you're, uh, you're uh, Roger, you're you're tapping into uh, dangerous territory right now, right? Picking uh, picking one over the other. That's like the ageless argument: who's better at placing the catheter? I don't think that argument's ever going to die. Well, I don't know if it's going to die. I can tell you what our experience is. Yeah. And we all live in our experiences, yeah. and you know, I'm not saying it's a unit. It's not. I'm not saying it's universal, but uh, that's why I asked what you guys do. And you, you know, you basically said you were surgeons. So I don't think you're doing that for kickback. I, I, I'm saying it jokingly. Well, yeah. You're doing, what do you you're do doing it for a, a reason. G, a GW, yeah, a, a GW now, like it's. Um, uh, we have uh, we have two surgeons to do it, but IR. Here, from my experience, they they don't place the catheters in the first place, so that's why I don't have any experience with them here. But yeah, no, at, at Vanderbilt, it was really nice because you have uh, you have like a number of surgeons to choose from as well, which was which was nice. But I think the experience probably in most other places is whoever can place them. Thank God we have somebody, and they'll do it. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Good job.